that's that's also something that helps showcase what the drummers can do themselves. Um, and that's that's my mission with this channel is is to be a showcase. Um, you know, I I want a guy who's never had a drum video made of him before them, anyone uh, to to be able to say accurately, hey, this is what I sound like and I sound great. So, this, you know, the, the playing you'll you'll get the playing and the vibe of the playing, the play style and the musical style, but to also have a really great recording behind it. That's that's a very useful tool for any musician, uh, whether they're promoting a band or whether they're pro promoting themselves or just to have as an archived piece of like, hey, this is me playing drums at this age at this time while I was working in this band and all that stuff. So samples, I'm so I'm not I'm not resampling kick drums and I'm not uh, replacing all the tom sounds and the snare sounds with with slate triggers and all that stuff. <laughs> it's all natural. Hey everyone, welcome back to the All Music Matters in That Podcast. I'm your host, Brian. And joining me today is a special guest hailing from Asheville, North Carolina, Dave Kamitsky. How you doing, brother? Doing great, man. Thanks for having me, Brian. I really appreciate it. Uh, no worries. And uh, this is actually a funny story because uh, my show, called The McGrip Show, I actually gave your channel a shout out. And, uh, you know, at first I thought it was actually a, a group of drummers because some channels I actually found involved like couple groups of people for instance i think there was one irish group i stumbled across a while back mm. so i was thinking this was like a whole group of people but when i reached out it turns out you're the one that's just running the channel is there anybody else or is it just you it is just me um and you know i'm i'm kind of representing the region uh western north carolina Asheville area uh as best i can with this online presence um but it is just me running the channel um, the idea behind this is to promote uh, the drummers of this region. And when I moved here a few years ago, I just kept on meeting drummers. And that's never happened to me uh, anywhere else I've been anywhere uh, where I just I just can't stop meeting more drummers. Turns out there's a ton of awesome bands here. There's just great bands and great drummers and a whole uh, just like a, a great um array of different genres and styles and as a way uh as a way to start promoting my studio and getting myself out there in this new music scene to me i thought what better way than to kind of uh try to raise all the ships so to speak in this region um and and be a platform provide a new platform online to to show what these guys are doing here Absolutely. That's a good thing you're doing too. And uh, I was trying to remember the last time I was down in Asheville. It might have been actually, Jimmy Christmas, it might have been already two years already, but uh, I actually did send you a link for a little vlog I did, which yeah, was a little cheesy. I checked out I checked out your uh, your visit to Asheville. It looks like you had a pretty good time. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, Asheville was absolutely amazing. We didn't exactly get to, I kind of wish we saw like more studios, for instance, kind of like uh, how we were able to walk into RCA studios down in Asheville, for instance. <laughs> so it would have been nice to do something like that. But unfortunately, it was more just like walking around, maybe doing some bar hopping here and there and seeing people playing their instruments out on the streets. So that's definitely an Asheville thing for sure. Uh, so you got you got that part of the experience, definitely. Uh, but it was if that video went up, what, a, a year and a half ago or two years ago? So that would have been during kind of the height of the pandemic. Is that right? Something like that. It might have been like yeah. 2021 maybe. Or I don't know if that was actually when we first finally got out of our little bubble because when we first started, when the pandemic least started, we just stayed kind of closed in, only going out, yeah. getting groceries and stuff like that. But wearing a mask and everything else. I don't know if that was our first trip. No, actually, that mm. wasn't our first trip. It might have been our second trip. Okay. Now that I remember. I think our first trip was Savannah, Georgia. So... Want to make, cool. So, want to make sure I got that right. <laughs> Can't get my history mixed <laughs> up here. I moved, so I moved here from Connecticut is where I'm like originally from. I moved here in March of 2020. So I came like right when the whole world shut down, right at the top. And I, I was, I'm in this new place that I'd never, 
I've been here to play shows with bands that I was in and stuff like that. And I've come through solo and on tour a few times, but I like was on an Island at the start of this global phenomena. Um, so, it, you know, I didn't, I didn't actually start getting out there myself and seeing my own, my own new town until, uh, like this past fall is when I started to emerge from my hobbit hole a little bit. Well, I was going to say, yeah, if you had just moved down right at the height of the pandemic, I would imagine that would be hard thing getting, or I was trying to figure out the word, with the wording behind it, or I had to get on the ground running or something like that, or something along those Absolutely. lines. Absolutely. It was really tough. It was really tough to start with. And I mean, I, my whole deal, I'm a, I'm a recording engineer and producer, and that's number one, what I am. And I've been playing in bands and working with bands ever since I was 16, 17, 18. I'm 32 now. Um, and I needed to change the scene from Connecticut. I've been all over the country working at different studios and cutting my teeth on various kinds of rock and metal albums and rap projects and jazz records and you name it. We can get into that stuff too. But um, I came here from Connecticut and... I had built a pretty successful uh, small business myself, just like recording all the rock and metal bands, mostly around around Connecticut and New England. Okay. And I just needed somewhere somewhere new to go. Um, but I love drums. I love drums number one. Um, as my, it's really genuinely my favorite instrument to record, and as the foundation of the music that I love, like rock music and popular instrumentation music. Um, it intersects with my job being an engineer and my love of music kind of perfectly being that foundation. I see. Well, you are, you ta you are touching on a little bit of like the first question right there too. So, and uh, on a serious note, are, have you been okay? I don't know if Asheville's been hit by the recent tornadoes that have been kind of tearing through Arkansas and Tennessee. Or has North Carolina been okay? We've been okay here. I mean, Asheville is a kind of an amazing geographic place in terms of being away from a lot of the natural disasters um, and kind of, uh, you know, we're not really in tornado land uh, and we're not really in hurricane land. So thankfully we're okay, but it's been, it's always tough to see the devastation that's going on. I was like, we don't want to have any of the Dorothy's house flying away and spinning around the tornado and ended up in the land of Oz or something like that. So, <laughs> Not today. <laughs> Not during this interview. <laughs> That's for sure. And we crash upon the witch wearing the ruby red slippers and be like, oh, no, Dave has inherited the red slippers. So there we go. I'm safe today, man. Right. <laughs> that sounds good. That's well, good to hear you're okay, man. So, uh, Dave, the way this podcast works is we get to know people more as the individual, but also as the musicians, too. So the questions here going to tie, tie into your story a little bit. So you have gotten into a little bit of your story, but I guess start with the first one here. Uh, who is Dave Kaminsky and what made him want to be like, hey, mom, I want to be a studio engineer or uh, or maybe some <laughs> version of a rock star or something like that. Basically, that's basically how it went. <laughs> um, I So I'm I'm a recording engineer and producer, a guitar player um, and a lifelong musician. Uh, and I come from a family of musicians. Um, so my my mom is a classically trained pianist and was a was a classical pianist for the first half of her life. My dad taught music theory at the University of Connecticut. He's a well-known figure in that, in the music theory circle. Uh, my uncle is a professional uh, arranger, producer, orchestrator, uh, keyboard player, um, all-around musician. I mean, amazing, amazing guy. And, and he's he's kind of who inspired me directly to get into the the audio, the professional audio side of things, as opposed to just pursuing performance as a musician. So it's just like everyone, everyone in my family, including my brother, who is who is a drummer and who I grew up playing music with. Um, you know, it's like I was surrounded by it. So there was no I didn't have to plead if I wanted to go to music school or if I wanted to follow or pursue pursue music in any way. That was kind of like a very accepted thing for me and my family growing up. And I, I feel really grateful for that because so many of my the people I work with and my friends and and peers didn't have support from their family and their circle when they were growing up when they wanted to pursue music. So that's that's how I 
that's a lot of how I got here is I had some incredible support and no one saying, no, you can't do this. Yeah. We'd be like, no, I am going to do this one way or the other. And if I don't like it, then I would say like, okay, you proved me right. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> I would say it's always funny. Families who like are very big musically talents, for instance, they always seem to like carry it on to the next generation. So I know that's how it was with me too. Cause my dad, he was never really mm. a committed play bass player, but he at least played every now and again with one of my uncles. And they goofed around doing like Black Sabbath sort of songs like that, and maybe a couple of Springsteen here and there, but they never really took it seriously. They were just goofing around, really. They did like, <laughs> I think something way back in the day, maybe before they even, before I even married my mom, he was probably even doing like shows in the back of my grandmother's house doing, oh, awesome. doing these little shows and stuff like that. I don't know if he drove the neighbors crazy or where they loved him, that sort of thing. I think people tend to be a little laid back when he started playing the maybe the early versions of rock and roll or jazz and stuff like that so but just having music around when you're growing up whether or not you end up going you know professional with it or it's it's like if you're surrounded by music in any way it becomes a part of you and it's such a universal language for us all that it's the easiest thing for us to pass on absolutely do and you also learn about the history that your yeah. parents, everybody had lived through too, even though they maybe weren't like a part of it, like Woodstock in 1969, for instance. So, mm -hmm. and then, <laughs> so I always get a kick out of it too. So it's always nice to learn something new. And then I think once you like see like these groups who've been playing since like the seventies, for instance, actually I did have my Kiss shirt on originally. So, but I saw Kiss actually before the pandemic had broken out. And that was my first time seeing them live. Cause I've seen like a couple of YouTube videos, mm -hmm. like, in some live shows they did maybe in like Chicago or I think one was Winterland. I don't know if that was in California and stuff like that too. So it's almost like if only you guys had the iPhones back then, that would have been so awesome. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. We're, we're pretty fortunate to have, I mean, you can, you can just hit up YouTube for any band that's done a show and there's at least, you know, cell phone footage of something that they've done recently. And that's, that's kind of an amazing thing that we have at our, at our disposal now and even for drummers making content, like I'm helping guys do with the Asheville Drummers Alliance channel, but like people, anyone who's got a cell phone can make a drum video, make a video of them playing their instrument or anything like that. And that's, that's incredible that we, that we have that available to us. I know when I was in Asheville, I did see like one person was like probably holding a little stick. I don't know if it was like a GoPro or something like that. They were just like filming people. <laughs> Try to like do their own little stunts. Oh, the buskers and the people at the street performers and stuff like that. Something like that, yeah. Maybe a couple, and I think maybe I don't know if it was like family members who were like a part of them. And they were just helping them get set up so they could just maybe make a little extra bucks on the side from whatever they could. There's also it's also I mean really genuinely a tourist draw, and that's something that with Asheville it kind of gets people kind of forget that there are there are kind of these kind of. Uh, vagrant populations who move through Asheville and sometimes people who are, you know, busking and, and performing on, you know, in downtown, they come through town. Sometimes they stay for a while. Sometimes they don't, but like, that's a part of the tourist experience. That's very unique to a place like Asheville and kind of adds some charm to it. Absolutely. Like I said, too, it was totally worth actually being there, but I guy wish we stayed long or at least got to see like a little bit more of it. Cause I think afterwards we had gone to Georgia and then afterwards, in order to like go see a cousin's place that we normally stay at. So we couldn't really stay there very long, so it would have been nice to at least see a little bit more. But eventually, when we do get back to Asheville, maybe a nice tourist. Or maybe, hey, we head up with Dave Kaminsky, and he can help us. Yeah, come visit, come visit me at, at the studio, and we can go around to some other places, and we'll see, we'll see the music of Asheville. Absolutely. Open invite. Come on down. Uh, speaking of which, uh, is this part of your studio you're in right now, or is this? Yeah, yeah. We're in the control room at my studio, which is called Studio Wormwood. I was either gonna say that, or is the man cave? <laughs> it actually before uh, before I bought the house, uh, the people had this is this is the basement of my home, and uh, and the people who had this house before me had it as like a home theater type thing, um, and I. I came in and spent basically most of the most of the pandemic just uh, rebuilding and renovating and turning this into essentially my dream studio. Um, and that that kind of is uh, once I built this place, I'd spent two years not going out and hustling for new clients and people to work with. 
and I had this crisis of like, oh shit, I have the studio that I needed to build for myself and I don't have anyone to record right now. <laughs> That's kind of where the, uh, some of the inspiration for the Asheville drummers channels, uh, came into play because I, I just wanted to start getting people in here and, and as if for no other reason to help me learn my room to help me learn the live room, which is right over there and, uh, learn how, uh, the control room sounds and every single different audio scenario that I could be in. And what better way for me to easily get somebody in here than to be offering videos to drummers for free or even just recording sessions for free, which is, so that's, that's how I, that's how I kind of got to this point with the channel. But, um, so you can segue that however you want to into your questions. <laughs> yeah, no, that's good. And, uh, I guess what sort of gear do you use whenever you're trying to do recording sessions? Cause it looks like a pretty expansive room. Otherwise, is it, is the camera lens meant to be deceiving or something like that? No, it's, it's, it's a moderately sized room. And, and I just really spent the time, um, trying to make it a, as perfect an audio environment as it could be. Uh, for critical listening in the control room and for mixing in the control room and for recording out in the live room over there. Um, for for the audio and audio interested folks, um, it's a it's a classic hybrid setup where I'm using a console and some outboard preamps as my front end. And I'm just working. I'm just working in Pro Tools as my DAW. Um, and I mix mostly in the box with some select pieces of outboard gear. My um, and, uh, it's, I run, I run the studio like any large format commercial room that, that you would find yourself in to, to make a record as a band, but I do it as a private, you know, in a private room in a private studio. Um, the workflow is the same though. And the professionalism is the same, which is, which is part of what makes the, the drum videos like a really cool experience for, for guys, because, if you can't afford to spend $10,000 on your record, you can still get that kind of recording experience when, when an artist, whether it's just a drummer or their bands works with me. It's just that we don't have the standalone building downtown and we don't have the, you know, the, the kitchen and the lounge for you to, <laughs> you know, to enjoy while your other guys are recording and all that stuff. Um, but but workflow wise, it's it's what you would expect from any like nice professional studio. I was gonna say I think you need like a what they I would dub the beer room where you just have all sorts of beer and stuff like that too. Since that seems to be, I don't know if it. I think it's always like for everyone, but it seems like people like to associate with like the metal and rock guys since that seems to be like where most of the controversy at times or maybe even like some of the funny stories seem to come out. This rocker is totally with drunk, a little man. bit of. Yeah, with a little bit of social lubrication. Um, yeah, I, I next on the next renovation, the next the next part of the studio build out. Uh, I'll do a lounge with a nice with a with the coffee station and the beer and and you know a little kegerator in there. I'll do the whole and it's perfect for Asheville being kind of beer city, uh, but not quite yet. It's it's stripped down. Um, my focus whether I'm recording a band's album or whether I'm doing a drum video is just on cutting right to the bone. We are making the best drum sound that we can. We're capturing the best audio and now visuals with the drum videos that we can. Um, and I'm going to mix it to sound what it, like whatever goals we set for ourselves ahead of the project. Um, so yeah, I don't have the fancy espresso machine, but you're going to sound fantastic and look good too. <laughs> I was just thinking like if you had, I don't know how the layout of your house is, but regardless, if you had room for like the patio right there, just like call it like yellow Niagara falls or something like that too. And people like just go over and just start hurling over the patio railing. <laughs> just be like, don't stand underneath that too. You can certainly take in the view, but don't. Thankfully it's not a, it's, it's not a party house. We are, we are, uh, we're, it's all studio, all, all that all the time. That's good to hear. All right. <laughs> So I guess, uh, how many rooms do you have all together? Is it just like one big room or do you have like a separate room for like the vocalist to go into and like scream into like maybe those little sound boxes that they have right there? Exactly. Yeah. So the studio is broken down into control room where we are, which is where the mixing desk is and cameras 
above the mixing desk. So I'm kind of looking at my station here. Um, and then directly that way is, uh, is the live room. So it's just two adjoining rooms, um, which for anyone who's built a studio knows that that can be problematic for sound leaking through your doorway between the spaces. But, um, you know, I've, I, I took great pains, uh, to do as much, uh, sound transmission reducing as possible between the two spaces, um, focusing just on, on treating the rooms so that we can capture a really great sound, uh, for any instrument right over there in the live room. Um, this, the space sounds great for drums. And if anyone checks out the Asheville drummers Alliance channel, all the studio videos that are on the channel have been recorded here. So you can get a, a sense of, of like what the room sounds like. Um, and something that's important to me, I mean, whenever I'm recording, I try very hard to stay away from using sample augmentation whenever I can. Um, so, so far, none of the videos have, have like any drum samples, any replacement or even augmentation, like a sample snuck up in there. It's just all the natural sound of the, of the microphones and of this room, which I'm really happy about. I say, yeah, I don't think I want to switch out the original audio just to like fill in something that's like filler noise, just to, like appease your audience. You want to like give them the real deal. That's something I do. Say, yeah, something <laughs> along those lines. That's that's also something that helps showcase what the drummers can do themselves. Um, and that's that's my mission with this channel is is to be a showcase. Um, you know, I, I want a guy who's never had a drum video made of him before them, anyone. Uh, to to be able to say accurately, hey, this is what I sound like, and I sound great. So this, you know, the the playing, you'll you'll get the playing, and the vibe of the playing, the play style, and the musical style, but to also have a really great recording behind it, that's that's a very useful tool for any musician, uh, whether they're promoting a band or whether they're pro promoting themselves, or just to have as an archived piece of like, Hey, this is me playing drums at this age at this time while I was working in this band and all that stuff. So samples, I'm, so I'm not, I'm not resampling kick drums and I'm not, uh, replacing all the Tom sounds and the snare sounds with, with slate triggers and all that stuff. <laughs> it's all natural. I was literally taking it all in. And the first thing that popped in my head was, did you ever see the movie Pulp Fiction? Oh, of course. Big Tarantino fan. Did you, uh, <laughs> I always love the wallet. It's the one that says bad motherfucker on it. Yeah. So I think it's, yeah. That's what, <laughs> I, I've only, that was probably not like a trademark or something. I would say just like sell something like that and whatever someone shows up on your channel too. <laughs> that's a good tag. Yeah. It would be nice. And, yeah. and, uh, we're big fans of, we're big fans of quitting over here. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. He's, a, he's an amazing <laughs> director too. In fact, uh, I know Reservoir Dogs, I think it was his intro to the Hollywood scene. And, and then Pulp Fiction was right after that. I think I've seen bits and pieces of Inglorious Bastards, but and I think the same thing with the Kill Bill uh, mm -hmm. duo because it, it wasn't a trilogy; it was actually just two movies. But it right. felt all the same thing. But I mean, yeah, despite like the sparse maybe time lapse between like each one, it's, it'll always deliver. So absolutely, even though, even though a lot of the stuff's like, what the hell was that? But it's still funny as hell. So I'm a huge film fan. I love dissecting movies and analyzing and, and just, I love watching movies for enjoyment, but like I being, being an engineer brain, right. I, I can't, I can't watch a technical piece of art with, in a, in a film and, and like not break down the, the, you know, the filmmaking techniques and, uh, the symbology behind why things were presented a certain way. So, um, this is kind of interesting. I mean, I, I've never made, uh, like uh, sh short movies or done any kind of filmmaking before. I've never really messed with cameras before I started doing the videos with the drummers. But I've always wanted to. I've always wanted to get into that and understand like the differences between audio editing workflow and video editing workflow. So this project has been amazing for me because it's gotten, it's allowed me a really easy way in to video production. Um, it's, you know, I never, I never did any video editing before this. And now I'm like whizzing around DaVinci Resolve and like not doing anything fancy, but feeling proficient in, in the simple things that I'm doing. And it's scratching a, a personal itch from a creative standpoint where I've only worked on in audio and music. 
And now I get to delve into video while still incorporating, you know, my strengths as an audio engineer. Um, so I'm, I'm thrilled about having that opportunity now. Absolutely. That allows you to kind of combine the two things you love together too. So that's always amazing. Yeah. But I guess uh, since you have been touching on your YouTube channel a little bit and it seems like you started it during the height of the pandemic too, let's try to mold these two questions together too. So I guess, uh, since you did say you did start your YouTube channel about 2020, I guess, uh, what was it you hoped to achieve at the time? I actually started the YouTube, the, yeah, the Asheville drummers channel is only like th four months old. This, I started, I think I posted the first one, um, shit back in, uh, in January of this year of 23 now. Um, and the idea, I mean, I really only had the idea to start doing this in like November of this past year of 22. Um, so the, the inspiration I, I touched on it a little bit before was like, I needed a way to introduce myself to this region's musicians. Um, you know, and socially and musically, uh, it's just a different part of the world than in new England where I came from and where I built my my business there originally where i where i built relationships and connections over years being there right so i'm in this new place and i you know i think it's important at least financially to not just take from a place that you're trying to endear yourself to and make a real lasting impact and build real relationships in um so just before i even got into like you know, investing in cameras and, and shooting videos, I was thinking like, let me just provide a free, a free service. Like, let me get in, offer people free sessions. Right. Um, but then to make it really worthwhile. So I wasn't devaluating, de devaluing my studio services. I wanted to provide something new and that's where the, the inspiration for the video side of this comes in. Um, so I started reaching out to all the drummers that I had met that since I'd, I'd moved here. And at first it was like 10, 10 messages to 10 different drummers. Um, and I immediately got a bunch of video sessions scheduled really easily because like, turns out people love recording and not having to pay for it. <laughs> like That's great. And it's important to me to be able to give, to give something back to this place. Um, and, and not just feel like I'm taking artists money, which, you know, times are tough for almost everybody right now. And I, I don't want to be that guy that doesn't recognize that, um, especially coming into a new place. So how I've been doing this is I just offer, I'll shoot a drum video for you for free and, uh, and I'll edit it. And it goes up on the channel on the Asheville drummers Alliance, YouTube channel. We'll promote it on Instagram and Facebook. And the bands will cross promote themselves and they, everybody promotes that video together and, and, uh, together we can kind of raise the profile of this region's music. Um, this region's drummers specifically, um, make some really cool content and hopefully show, show people from outside of Asheville that this is a great place to come make a record. It's a great region to come visit. Uh, this is a great place to come and play on tour all that stuff. Yeah, I think when you do start off with like any sort of project, really, it seems like you have to like either do it for free or you gotta like keep the price like real low. So it's always like that store five or below. I don't know if they have like a store like that down in the North Carolina, but it's kind of like the Dollar General or the Dollar Store. And basically now they say like five or below. So basically, you know, those things are exactly. Price. So it's, it's sort of along those lines. And, uh, I did actually figure the term hit the ground running. That's what I wanted to say earlier too. But, <laughs> but, uh, but that's pretty much what you had to go through when you moved from Connecticut down to Asheville during the height of pandemic. So I guess how bad did yeah. COVID impact you and your family? Um, it was it was not easy, man. Uh, you know, I, I I took I took the pandemic pretty seriously myself, and without comparing to how anyone else addressed the situation because it's different for everybody um i just i hunkered down for for about two plus years two almost and a half years from march until genuinely about like september of this past year uh, two and a half years 
um, of not going out, not seeing concerts and not doing the kinds of things, uh, the networking things that I, that I would normally think to do, um, to introduce myself to a new place, a new city. Um, you know, and I, I got sick for the first time, uh, with COVID this past summer and it screwed me up pretty good. Uh, and you know, and it's not a unique story. There's almost everybody has, has gotten sick with this thing at least once. And, you know, I, I've had it twice now in a span of six months. It's not fun at all. Um, and it definitely, it's definitely a thought on my mind when I go out and see music, you know, what kind of calculated risk are, are we taking by just kind of trying to move on at this point? Um, but when I first moved here, like I, I bought this house. I didn't think I was going to build a studio into it. I had no idea that any of this was going to unfold over the, over the next two years. Um, once it turned out that the world was really shutting down in March of 2020, um, that's, that's kind of when I had to pivot from what I was in. I, w- I thought I would like Airbnb the upstairs of this house and live downstairs and like have a little laptop mix rig and just work remotely. Um, I had no intentions of building like a great studio here myself until I like didn't want to host people, you know, tourists during during the height of the thing. Um, so so that's that's kind of where what brought me here now three years later is like I I just had to immediately pivot once I got into this place um I was just here with like there's no shows there's no music there's no like I can't go out and network <laughs> like I, what? I had no idea what to do um so I just kind of started knocking down walls <laughs> well, I guess what'd you do for the two years in order to like keep yourself afloat well, thankfully, you know, there were so many projects like the world just kind of ground to a halt and and that didn't necessarily grind all of the existing projects in um, th- that were that had already started or kind of been in the works. All of those things were still ongoing. So um, I had I had about a year and a half of somewhat pretty consistent work uh, starting with like the late spring of 2020 that was like already kind of in, in the works, like it was planned. Um, so that, that got me through most of those first two years. Then it started to, to, to lean out a little bit. Um, as, uh, as I think the world kind of began to move on in 2020, uh, 22, this past year, um, is when, I started to realize I wasn't just going to be able to live off of, off of like old, old connections and, and past clients and, and former work. Um, I was going to have to really like, like pound the pavement locally and, and make an impact where I am now. So that was another paradigm shift of like the next phase of figuring this whole thing out. Uh, and I'm really fortunate to all the bands that have, have, uh, chosen to work with me during through during that time i drove i drove up i i did records in connecticut uh, i drove from here to the northeast again to go work with bands up there um i did a record in los angeles during the pandemic i drove all the way out there um just just this like i'll go wherever the work is anyway but um the fact that i was able to stay afloat with some really awesome albums uh before settling in here now it it means everything you drove all the way out to la oh hell yeah oh my gosh it's cool i'm a road trip guy anyway i'd say as much as cool as it is i have a hard time just like sitting down for like i know you take like little breaks here and there but even still like sitting down for eight to ten hours has always been really a pain for me so i imagine you had to like what stop twice to like stay overnight and stuff like that yeah i think i broke up I broke up the trip into like 12 to 14 hour driving days or so. Um, so I did Asheville to little rock, Arkansas, then little rock all the way. Oh shit. I did little rock all the way to Santa Fe, New Mexico. (laughs) That was, that was probably 15 hours or so driving and then Santa Fe to LA. Um, 
And I did it again in three days on the way back, uh, on the way back home. But I'm a road dog. I mean, I, I grew up like playing on tour and doing stuff with bands and like just wanting to being super, super driven to see new parts of the country and see new bands and see, you know, what's the best brewery in some new city? Like what's the best place to eat breakfast at some new city? Like that's the shit that drives me. So it's a no brainer. Like if a band is, is on the other side of the earth, like fuck it, I'll go record you at your place. I can't wait to travel there. Like <laughs> anywhere I'll go. I don't care. You know, as much as I do love traveling too, I'd say just the fact of sitting in the car for those extensive amount of hours always drove me and my parents crazy to be honest. But I guess the fit was the airfare not very good during that time, or was it still like kind of strict about the whole COVID policy? Actually, to be honest with you, man, I just didn't feel comfortable flying. I didn't want to be on, you know, a Asheville to LA flight with two changeovers, um, especially considering that, like, you know, studio time is bu- so like. Okay, I'm a outside producer coming to do a record in Los Angeles. We booked the studio time six months in advance, right? If I got COVID on the way, right, you know, in a in a place, you know, like in an airport, I wouldn't be able to forgive myself for like missing the sessions and having to scramble and figuring out new accommodations and all that stuff. And like that's that's band's money that I just wasted by getting sick myself. So for me you know, being, you know, having a, having a supportive partner who like doesn't mind that I hop in the car and drive to California when I need to, um, and wanting to do that myself and being able to do that myself physically and mentally. Um, yeah, it's just kind of a no brainer, uh, to, it was a no brainer at least then to reduce the risk, um, of getting sick and screwing up the time. Well, you are indeed a trooper. I will give you that. So, (laughs) <laughs> dedicated on a lot of levels yeah you know i was actually thinking of the other questions uh, i guess uh let's jump right into the two instruments you did mention you do play so which one do you love most the drums or the guitar um outside of the name that's, of the channel. that's a really good question that's a really good question because i don't really play drums um you know my i grew up playing guitar and my brother who's four years younger than me is the drummer in the family and we were you know, from the time that he was like nine years old and I was 12 or so, 12, 13, uh, we were, we were playing or trying to play our favorite metal band songs. And, um, I've just always gravitated to drums. I just didn't want to play them because I, you know, it, it never, it never felt like that's what I should be doing myself. But as a, as a, I had to start recording our, you know, I had to start recording our bands when we were writing music for the first time. And that's when I fell in love with recording the drums and understanding the drums as an instrument, understanding what each drum itself does in the scheme of the instrument as a whole and ways to manipulate the sound to better articulate what you're doing, what you, what you're trying to say musically. Like that's the stuff that really, um, started to pique my interest as a young person, as an adolescent musician. And guitar was always there. I spent, I spent, you know, six to eight hours a day for, you know, my high school, my middle school and high school years, just trying to shred like Alexi Leho, you know, and my favorite heavy metal guitar players at the time. I just wanted to sweet pick all damn day. (laughs) And I did. I sat in my room and I sweet picked all day. (laughs) Um, And guitar was always kind of like a little bit of a labor of love. It's a complicated. I think a lot of people who play guitar have this relationship with the instrument where like you write music because you need to like you need to get those emotions out of you and those feelings. You need to say those things melodically. Right. But it may not always be like a love affair with the instrument with drums, because I don't play them like I don't I'm not a drummer. I have a drum a studio kit that I mess around with and enjoy playing sometimes. But like I'm not a guy that can say I'm a drummer, but I have a I have a lifelong love affair with the drums. 
and that's a it's a cool it's a cool distinction because like I don't have to come home to play drums. I don't have to like that's not my my musical home. That's like my musical mistress almost. <laughs> I was just picturing too like <laughs> whatever you said at fair too. I think like the guitar just walks in, you're playing on the drums and be like, David, what are you doing? Do you <laughs> We're breaking up right now. I'm leaving you. Goodbye. <laughs> that sort of thing. But I guess uh, what sort of a brand are your guitar and a drum set? I know you said it's a studio set for the drums, but uh, what kind of brand yeah. is it? Yeah, let's talk about let's talk about the drums. Yeah. Um. So I've got for the studio, I got a, a Yamaha Stage Custom Birch. It's like one of the most widely sold drum sets, and so many people have them, but they're just awesome shells. They're just great drum shells. Um, it's just the standard what twenty two kick, uh, ten, twelve, sixteen tom pack um and as an all-purpose shell pack for the studio uh it's something that i can always whip out and say hey mine sound great if you don't want to use yours that was kind of a no-brainer um you know maybe not the very best sounding drum shells ever to be made but with a good with a good head and some nice tuning and in a good space like they'll always just sound good um so that's what I got for the studio, and I also I've got a, a set of um, Zildjian K Suite cymbals that I got for the studio as well, which again are just like really good all-purpose cymbals. They record well. They are totally good in a live situation. They're bright without being harsh, which are all things that I look for in cymbals. Um, and I don't know. I, I just I I love. If I could spend a thousand dollars a month on drums, I totally would. <laughs> yeah, this, I, I would spend a thousand a month on drums, man. Oh, dude, I, you know, a new snare drum and a new like I've got a on the list. I want to get another snare drum. Hmm. I want to get like a bell brass because uh, I only have the like kit, the shell pack snare drum here. Uh, I want a few different snares to choose from. I want a few different kicks to choose from. And I want a, a whole slate of different symbols to choose from. Um, my fi- my personal favorite symbols, both for recording and like making music with, are the Minol Byzance. Um, and just like super super dry, almost jazzy, sandy symbols, are like what my mind wants to hear. At least when it comes to my own music or like a drummer that I'm playing in a band with, those are my favorites. So. One day, that that's like going to be the next symbol set that I try to outfit for the studio. Well, you don't need to look very further because I actually know a friend. Uh, his name's Eric Henninger. He's or his uh, YouTube name's the Drum Addict, and he actually builds custom drums. Oh, that's awesome! So if you want to just reach out to him, just like say, like, "Hey, can I get a custom snare?" He'll make it for you. You just tell him the dimensions. You tell him everything you want. He'll make it happen for you. That's super cool, and that actually, I want to talk about this for a second. Um, one of the future projects that that I'll be doing with the Asheville Drummers Alliance channel is I'm going to start getting into kind of broaching the almost documentary style um, filmmaking. Uh, there's a drum, there's a great drummer here in Asheville uh, named Alex Tolini, and he is a drum builder himself, but he also is a guitar luthier. He works for an Asheville, Asheville-based guitar company called Illuminati Guitars, uh, and they're they're metal guitar, they're aluminum guitars. Um, so he's he's on both sides of the instrument building coin, um, but he and I've talked a lot about you know he he builds drums for he builds custom drums, and it's something that he's super passionate about. So f- something that that you know for the channel going forward sometime happening this spring we're going to start filming uh the the drum journey like what what happens along the journey of a drum from from uh beginning to end of its life <laughs> like how we build this in every stage so that's that's a thing uh to to look forward to on the on the channel you know i've actually been thinking of doing somewhat of a documentary series too that's actually what that little vlog i sent you was kind of yeah. It was kind of meant to be at first, and like I said, it was cheesy because I <laughs> we didn't really play it out too well. In fact, that was me not doing a very good job because I think I was just happy to find a get out of the house, just go out and start traveling all over the place. So Totally. So it would be nice to actually do something about that, maybe start off in and around, because I'm from Pittsburgh, actually. We got 
it's not as big as like Asheville's, but at least has at least decent music music scene with like all sorts of genres here and there. So it's good to at least see like many cities in around the states starting to like get their own little music build up here and there. Nice little music scene here and there. So absolutely, I love Pittsburgh. I'm a huge fan of Pittsburgh, and and I visited my girlfriend and I visited Pittsburgh last summer, and it it was the first time that that I'd been to Pitt uh, since man, like maybe 2018. Um, and I've spent a good amount of time around the city getting to know the music and the food and the beer and just like the culture of the place. And I fell in love with it again. It's just an awesome place. And there's tons of great music happening in Pittsburgh. Like, for it, it, I is that where you live currently? Is that where you're from right now? Born and raised. I've been here for oh, a good awesome. while. So. That, awesome. Actually, when I reached out, I thought you had been born and raised in Asheville too. I didn't actually know you moved down there. Like, couple years back so that was a little bit of an interesting story (laughs) yeah well you know life life takes us uh many interesting places and you can never really predict where you know how it'll go but i i'll at least for me i'll speak for myself like i that's how i've set up my life is to kind of go where i need to and uh you know try a whole bunch of different places out but i'm really excited to be where i am i'm also always excited to go travel somewhere a city i've been to before or somewhere i've never been and go see some new stuff i actually started doing like little travel vlogs because that this is actually something i meant to tie in earlier but i was in nashville a couple of months back and that was actually the first time i actually got covid on the way back from the trip oh no so, I, I was actually in a- nashville for a little bit i'm trying not to get the two mixed up because it's really just a one syllable difference nashville and tennessee that nashville, one, right? nashville tennessee yes <laughs> okay so also a great town. Oh, absolutely. I've got, I love Nashville. Did you go and do like, what kind of stuff did you do while you were out there? Outside of bar hopping on Broadway, a couple of nights. Uh, we actually went to Johnny Cash Museum. We went to the Country Music cool. Hall of Fame. Uh, I think I'm always pronouncing this studio wrong. So please, nobody, I, th- I always like to pronounce it RCA Studios. That's where many of the big artists had come in together. Yeah. I'm really hoping I'm pronouncing it right, because otherwise I don't want people to start hating me in the comments for it. But... <laughs> We went to that studio and uh, I actually did the hop on, hop off a couple times. And I gave us a nice little history of like where everybody was at too. I know. I think the funny one was with Reba McIntyre. And I think her husband was trying to <laughs> fly a helicopter onto one of their houses too. And I guess it didn't, oh, man. it didn't go well, but no, nothing tragic or anything like that too. But I guess it was a bad divorce too. <laughs> so everybody's all good. And I mean, really just had a blast. And, uh, Nashville is such an awesome city and I, you know, it's, it's about five hours away from us in Asheville and uh, I'm looking forward to spending more time out there now going forward because it's, it's so rich with, with music production and just music making in general across all genres too. Like I think a lot of people who haven't been there, especially recently still associate Nashville with being like a country town. And to me, at least every time I've been there, it's like, it's fucking heavy metal. Like it's a rock and roll city now. And maybe like the touristy places, especially like down, like downtown, downtown still are like dripping with country, which is great. But like go over to East Nashville and like that side of the river. And that, which is where I, I hung out like the last few times that I spent days and days there. And man, like every bar you walk into, uh, you're, you're talking with like session musicians who were in sessions that day, you know, and you're talking with like, like dude, dudes, like people who, who like are incredible and just chilling at their watering hole at the end of the night, you know, in like a, you know, CD rock and roll dive bar. Like that's, that is so cool. And it's, it's, it almost made me move to Nashville. I was like really thinking about it. Um, so I got I got a lot of love for that city. You know, even tragically too, after what had happened recently there too with the school shooting. So, so hearts out to Nashville too. So absolutely, absolutely. I wanted to say a resilient town though. Absolutely, for sure. I would say uh, Broadway had a little bit of a mix of the bluegrass country and maybe a little bit of fusion of like the hard rock, maybe a little rock and roll here and there. I think the one was a uh, Lucky Bastards Saloon. That was a yeah. that was one of them. <laughs> Well, those players can play anything. That's the amazing thing. Like, it's it's one thing to go see a metal show and the guys can shred, 
right? But can those guys walk down the street to the country bar and shred in that musical context? Probably not. Or vice versa? Sometimes they can, and that's the sign of an amazing musician, but like the country guys, like the guys who were playing on Broadway, those those bands are full of people who can just play literally anything. They're some of the most amazing musicians that you'll ever see. It's it's like mind blowing. And they can do it at will. You can ask you can ask them like, some some bars you'll go into, like even just like house bands in Nashville, you'll you, you know, people shout requests. Like the whole thing is people shout requests. Play free bird. And they'll they'll rip it in whatever and put their own like style and twang onto it. However, that's going to be, um, it's that's, that's like one of the cooler musical things to me.